Hey parents, what if there was nothing stopping you from becoming abundant to the max in all things? Finances, time, nothing was holding you back from becoming your healthiest, happiest, most financially abundant self yet and sharing these tools with your kids. Thanks to our annual and monthly angel members, we've been able to grant over $100,000 in partial scholarships so that souls who want access to life-changing teachings in the angel membership have that opportunity. And every membership comes with teachings specifically for kids. Don't let your egoic mind tell you you're not worthy because the angels and I are here telling you You are worthy. This is your year, but I can't help you get where you're going if I'm not working with you in one of my programs. Become an angel member now. Go to theangelmedium.com, then the angel membership tab to sign up today. If you need a scholarship, let us help you. Scroll to the bottom of the angel membership page and click the link for partial scholarship options. Details are in the show notes. And thank you. Thank you for coming together as a community. Thank you for contributing what you can each month. And thank you for helping us to reach hundreds of souls with life-changing teachings in the membership this year. This is going to be your best year yet. Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome back to the Intuitive Kids Podcast. I'm your host and author, Julie Jancis, and I'm so excited for you to meet our guest today. Her name is Miss Susan Tantillo, otherwise known as Mrs. T. Um, it's still hard for me to call you anything else than Mrs. <laughs> T. I um I had Mrs. T as a teacher. She was my favorite teacher. I would say out of all of my years of school, just taught me more than I ever really understood she was teaching me at that time. I had Mrs. T for all four years of journalism in high school. And she opened up so many doorways for me at that time. Um, So Mrs. T, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Well, it's fun to be here. Thanks, Julie. Yeah. When I was going through high school, it was such a hard time. Um, I was learning about myself. I was going through a lot with my family as my parents were getting divorced. And journalism for me was an outlet that I didn't know I needed, but I loved so much getting to learn how to interview different people. And it gave me what I recognize now as an adult, these little wins, right? All throughout high school. And hindsight is 2020. Looking back on it, I recognize now that confidence is really built and stamina and motivation is really built by these little small wins in life. So I just wanted to thank you so much for all that you've given me. Well, my pleasure, certainly, Julie. I I, I didn't have too many students for all four years, but I remember that, that you were one that I did. And what made you decide to sign up for journalism in the first place? Because, of course, it was an elective. Yeah. Um, I felt in middle school that I was bad at writing and I wanted to get better. And you remember Jenny Matringa? Um, sure. She came in to our middle school with a group of other people who are also um, in journalism at, at the high school. And they said, listen, this is a club that you can get involved in. You'll write stories for the paper and you'll learn and you'll meet different people. And I was like, this is a way to get better at writing. Um, so I hopped into it and didn't know that it would be the catalyst for, I don't think I would have started this podcast, you know, 20 years, wow, 25 yeah. years later without having that experience. Um, Because from high school, learning how to write, and you taught us so well, just like so intricately, how to put stories together. I was able to go to my college newspaper at Northern Illinois University, write for them. And they did something cool in the staff room where they would give away like 
Journalist of the Week awards in the staff uh -huh. meetings in the newsroom. And other people would be like writing one, two stories a week. And I try and churn out five. Oh, good for you. <laughs> week. I don't think I had a, like a benchmark of what was normal. Um, so I constantly got the award and people today are like, how do you turn out three podcast episodes a week? It was from that experience going all the way back to ninth grade. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Well, that's what well, I want. Yeah. Talk, you, talk you built, you built up a lot of self-confidence, um, along the way and ended up you need to tell everybody that you ended up being editor in chief of the newspaper when you were a senior. And did your group go back and visit middle school to recruit too? I know some years we did that and some years we didn't, we couldn't work it out time wise, but we didn't, but I so wish that we would have, it would have been a great thing. Yeah. It didn't always work out with if the teachers didn't have time or, you know, it, the, the logistics were kind of tricky. So I'm sure glad that, that Jenny Matringa um, was able to <laughs> go yes. that year and convince you. And I'm still, I was still friends. I'm friends with her on Facebook. One of the things that I think is really cool about Facebook is my ability to be able to keep in touch with so many of my former students. I've been retired for 20 years now, um, which is sort of hard for me to wrap my head around, but um, it's just fun yeah. to, to keep, be able to keep in touch as adults. You know, it's amazing. When I don't, well, you're you're in touch with everybody. <laughs> well, I don't know about everybody, but, you know, uh, Don Tantillo, my husband, was the debate coach at Wheeling High School where Jenny or where um, Julie went. And well, Jenny, too, for that matter. But um, and I was his assistant. And so I I think that probably the two most life changing things that anybody could get involved in in high school would be journalism and debate or both um certainly one or the other because it it teaches you so much about um talking mm -hmm. public speaking um which anybody's going to need no matter what they do for a career you know not everybody's going to be a journalist not everybody's going to be a lawyer but um if you have that if you have that experience from high school and you know you have to go out and interview people you can't just sit down and then say nothing. You've got to be prepared. You've got to have some questions to ask them. And the same thing in a debate round. If if you're standing up in front and your opponent is asking you questions because there's a cross-examination time when there's a little interaction, it's not all prepared ahead of time. Um, you have to have an answer. You can't just stand there and say nothing. So you learn to think on your feet. Um, you learn... Um, in, in doing interviews, you learn to think about the, the answers that people are giving you and then make new questions on the fly from those answers. So I think all of that is really critical thinking skills that that are you know very valuable no matter what somebody's going to go into. You know, um, I don't like to toot my own horn, but the one thing that I feel the most pride in with doing the Angels and Awakening podcast is I get to interview now just uh, people of all walks of earth and everybody tends to say the same thing on the show. They'll always say, that's a great question or nobody's asked it like that. And I was like, yes, that's from my high school teacher. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm so happy to hear that. That, yeah. that, makes, me, that makes me very proud of you. Thank well, you. I, I did. Um, do a little after I retired 20 years ago I then I started to teach um a, an online class at the college level so I've kept my hand sort of in teaching a little bit although I did retire from that also um three years ago I guess uh I'm still helping some master's students with their projects their final big project which is sort of like a thesis but it's uh, it's called a professional project in this in this particular discipline through Kent State University. So I, I still am in touch with, um, you know, some, some students, um, but they're all ages now. They're, it's not like, you know, they're just between 18 and 22. These, in many cases, this master's program draws professional journalists who are looking ahead, seeing that they're not going to have a job in a traditional newsroom anymore. 
And maybe they're not going to have a job in journalism anymore, but because they've got their background, they can university. But in most cases, they have to have a master's degree in order to do that. And so as adults, they're going back and, and earning this master's degree. So it, that's an interesting angle um, on things, too. But, you know, it's not just journalism or debate as as far as high school activities go. I think it's important for anybody to have some kind of outlet. I mean, you played sports, too, right? Were you I on the did. tennis team? Do I remember that you were on the tennis team? Um, I was not on the tennis team. I was uh, I walked out of school one day and track was going on. And okay. um, you remember Mr. Rappaport? He sure. he was like, you should be on track. And I was like, I don't know what I would do. I can't run that well. So I did shot put on track okay. for okay. six months. Yeah. Um, but you know what? That is the other thing. Being an adult and looking back on your experience with life, being involved in high school kind of was like a way to advance, level up, learn in a way that it was easier to get involved in college, right? And mm -hmm. after that, when you get into the real world, it was easier to get involved then too. Getting involved has taught me, and I think they, I learned this really freshman year of high school, the more you get involved, the more you put into something, the more you're gonna get out of it. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Absolutely true. And you uh, you learn a lot of other, like you mentioned, life skills from being involved in extracurricular activities, no matter what they are, whether it's whether it's sports like we were talking about or whether it's some music, you know, band or or chorus or, um, you know, anything like that doing volunteering in the community i know that now i don't know if this was true when you were in high school but now um i believe in illinois and probably a lot of other states students have to do, put in so many hours of volunteering in the community for community service oh just to be and in so, high school or yeah, just to graduate yeah. wow yeah. that's awesome i think there's a i think there's a requirement now of I don't know how many hours it is, but you know, the, so you, you work with some kind of local agency. Um, I know there are some students who um, we've got the election coming up next month. There'll be high school students working at the polls um, as I don't know what those roles are. Judges, maybe um, handing out ballots to people and collecting them back and making sure that, you know, it's everything is by the book and that they are actually registered voters and all that sort of thing. Um, and I think that started because maybe there weren't enough people who could give up a day from their adults who could give up sure. a day from their job, you know, to go sit at the polls because it's a really long day. It's like from five in the morning until seven at night or something like that. And so um, the people in charge of getting those volunteers reached out to high schools and especially kids like taking U.S. history their junior year. And to see if they would like to come and have this experience, you know, see how democracy works, kind yeah. of. And so that would that would count as community service hours, I'm sure. And and working like with a food pantry or working, you know, any kind of volunteer sort of thing. And those kinds of jobs, too, um, help you to develop a lot of skills, time management, and and again, the talking to people piece, and um, just having a lot of showing that you can take responsibility for something and carry it through. Mm -hmm. And even for people who don't go to college, because because college isn't for everybody, of course, um, all those kinds of skills are really important to develop. And I think the earlier you can develop them, the better off you are because you can practice them more and you've got things to put on a resume that you were involved in these activities and you had these kind of leadership positions and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering too, I was thinking back to a time where you and I went to a conference for, I was in high school, it was for journalism, but it was out in Washington, D.C. Uh -huh. You know, I think it was 1998. 1990, oh my gosh, how so. do you remember I that? I have no idea, but that's when I think it was. <laughs> uh, I think you might be right. Uh, 
I can tell by my high school pictures what year it was based on the length of my hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fun. <laughs> um, and I think I had short hair then junior year. What I remember, though, is this conversation you and I had on on the Metra. And you said, Julie, you know, there might not be cell phones or the Internet right now. And we didn't even really know what that was. But everything is about to change. And journalism itself is about to change dramatically. And I, I think it's such a profound generation that we were at that time to have known what life was like before cell phones, before the internet, and then to kind of grow up with the internet in college and then get cell phones. And journalism did change. Marketing changed. Used to just be that you would get your news. Every night my parents would turn on the five o'clock news and they would watch the five o'clock news as they were getting dinner ready. Mm -hmm. We had newspapers, the radio. There wasn't a lot else out there. And today, when you go on to YouTube or social media or TikTok, there are these algorithms that are getting to know what what the user wants, what the user likes, and is feeding a person more and more and more just of what they want to know about, which isn't true journalism, not that they're trying right. to be journalists, but in journalism, you taught us how you see both sides, you analyze both sides, you ask questions of both sides, and you find the truth in the middle. And I'm just wondering, for those who don't know what I mean, there was a, a basketball player who talked about this on a documentary, but he said one morning he was just lying in bed um, on YouTube searching the the world is flat and he kept watching all of these videos the world is flat the world is flat and so he put up a post on social media saying he believed the world was flat that was really the algorithms throwing that information to him and um so i'm wondering what your perspective is on this you've been in journalism for how many years and around oh. it <laughs> Well, I've been in and around journalism for a uh, way long time. Um, let me think, uh, like about 60 years, I suppose. Um, but we won't really go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what ha what happens, I guess, is that it puts so much more responsibility on individuals to try to sort through what's true and what isn't. And I think that's part of what's wrong with our country right now. I don't want to get political, but um, like you said, the more you watch of something, the more the social media um, platforms feed you that same viewpoint. And so I think schools really need to step up in terms of helping kids learn um, how how to be news literate, how to be media literate. I mean, media literacy would be the whole big picture of all different kinds of media. How to how to use different platforms in the best way possible to get a message out or to understand a message or to, you know, communicate with friends or whatever. Um, but then a smaller part of that, and the most important part, would be the news literacy part. And there are several organizations, I actually, I looked some up this morning so I could share them with you, so you could share them with your audience, but um, that are devoted to sorting out the difference between fake news and real news, um, fact and opinion, um, that kind of thing. And right now, of course, I haven't, I haven't been in a public school for, like I said, 20 years, so I don't know if if schools are teaching this through like through social studies or through English or through you could teach it through any subject. And, and I remember once upon a time there was um, 
uh, one year we had a goal that revolved around writing across the curriculum. So every teacher in every class, no matter what they were teaching, was supposed to include some sort of writing component. So even if you were, you know, math teachers, story problems, that's pretty easy. Um, science teachers writing up the lab reports, that's pretty easy. I mean, I suppose the PE teachers had the most <laughs> difficulty trying to, you know, have some sort of writing component in their class. But you know, it would be really good if there was some sort of media literacy and news literacy component across the curriculum so that students didn't have to figure out how to sort this out for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a study. It's not real recent. It was 2017. There's a study done by um, an organization called Common Sense Media. Their website is commonsensemedia.org. And um, they interviewed, I think it was close to 900 or surveyed close to 900 um, students and across the country and across, you know, they tried to control for racial. And I think the age was the age range was like from 10 to 18. And I was sort of surprised by the fact that 48 percent of those students said that following the news was important to them. Hmm. I wouldn't have thought it would be that high. But 39% um, of them said that they're on online is their preferred source. Now, I don't know if that means they read a newspaper online. I sort of doubt it. I imagine they're talking about social media and getting their news, you know, from from their friends or yeah. from just random social media interaction. Um, but I think that, um, somehow we've got to get to the point where if it's not taught in school, then people need to, to know where they can go on the internet to help them sort out the difference between, um, real news and fake news. And that there are, I think there are three pretty good, um, resources. One is called the News Literacy Project. And that um, that web address is newslit, N-E-W-S-L-I-T dot org. And visiting that website, there are tabs for educators, and then there are tabs for the general public. And then it'll take you to, um, oh, like, exercises to try to figure out you know what's the difference between news and opinion and how you can how you can look at something that um is on a website and try to figure out if this is truth or not or if it's totally biased or unbiased um one of one another one is called um politifact.com p o l i t i FACT.com. And that's actually run by an or a um, think tank sort of in Florida called um, the Pointer Institute, which is um, a really great place for all kinds of report reporters and um, other people who work for in the media to go and get they have seminars and they have um, they have a whole sort of learning bank that people can use. But the, they came up with six quick tips hmm. to look to look at any anything on online that you're reading to see if it's biased or not. And um, the six things that that they talk about are: is there a byline? Mm -hmm. So is there somebody who's taking responsibility for having written this? That would be one thing. Is there, if there's a photo, is there a photo credit so that you could really, you know, track down is this photo real? And during the recent hurricane, I saw I saw photos on Facebook, like a shark swimming down the street of I think Fort Myers, yeah. Florida. Well, I have no idea if that was true or not because you know the the storm surge was so terrible that it could have been true. But because it was just posted by some random person and it didn't have 
any of these <laughs> these these points that I'm talking about now, you know, I just figured, oh, somebody just made that up. You know, they just photoshopped photoshopped the shark fin into the horrible storm surge, and it's not true. But I didn't go and actually um, research to see if it was true. I just figured it wasn't. Anyway, so a byline, a photo credit, clear sourcing. So if if people need to be quoted in the story and they need to be identified and you need to be able to, you know, verify that they're actually a person speaking with authority from whatever source it says. So that's the third thing. Um, another thing that people can do is go see if that same story is being reported other places. Now that takes a little bit more work, of course, but, um, you know, if you see a story in in a mainstream newspaper like the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Chicago Tribune or whatever, probably you're going to find that same story reported in those other mm-hmm. places, mm-hmm. and that helps to give it credibility. But if it's just some random story out there that you can't, if you try googling it and you can't find it any place else, it's probably not true. Um, another one is, does it have a date? You know, most most mainstream media sources not only give you a date, but they give you an hour and a, maybe even a second when this was posted or when it was updated or whatever. But things that are missing that probably have some flaws. And then the last one that they talk about in these six quick tips is, is it free of obvious errors like spelling, things mm-hmm. like that? I mean, that's that's when you get strange emails, you know, saying... Oh, yeah. You uh, you just bought this on Amazon and it's coming to you. Things like that. Oftentimes, there's misspelled words in those emails. That and that's a big tip that you know somebody didn't really edit this carefully or didn't know what they were doing. So the same is true of stories online. Now, sometimes as news um, news outlets have gotten rid of their copy editors because those seem to be the people who went first. Huh. Um, because they weren't out reporting stories, you know, they're sitting in the newsroom editing other people's copy. Which I think is a hard more, job. <laughs> yeah. More, <laughs> more errors were showing up in the in newspapers. I mean, even mainstream media reading a story and here's an obviously misspelled word or an obvious, like here's a sentence that doesn't have any verb or, you know, this doesn't make any sense because there's no copy editor. Um, but if you find something that's, you know, riddled with errors, that's probably not true either. So those tips were from that politifact.com um, site. And what they normally do is check, um, you know, like speeches made by the president or by political candidates or um, whatever officials. Um, and then they, do a fact checking of that a very thorough fact checking and then on their site it says whether this is true or somewhat true or not true at all another one and this one actually anybody can put in um, a story or a topic and find out they'll tell you back there used to be um snopes.com and i don't know if that's still around you could put in a topic and see if it was true or not. Um, But factcheck.org, you can do that too. They also post things every day that they've checked, but um, you can put your own in there. So those three, I think, if, if people want to explore on their own about, you know, trying to learn about news literacy, those three sites, newslet.org, politifact.com and factcheck.org um, would be good resources. That's awesome. I know I have one name for you. Well, yeah. I know a man named Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, Schrockman, S-H-R-O-C-K-M-A-N. Um, anyway, at the time he was executive director of PolitiFact and um, he came and and did a presentation. That's where I got those six quick tips from his presentation there. I wasn't there, but it was written up in the 
in the magazine that advisors get. So um, that's where I got that. Um, so, you know, that's you might. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And because that's with the Pointer Institute, uh, they're interested in education. So they mm-hmm. might very well be somebody that would come on and talk with you. I love it. Well, that's perfect. And what a great message to um, everybody listening that you don't have to believe everything that you read. Everything that you read isn't fact. And you can go check it for yourself at these resources, which we'll put in the show notes below. Um, No, I think that that's fabulous. And then just getting involved, like to your point, sports are wonderful and they're great, but there's so many other ways to get involved in school. I would interview people who were doing the plays and um, folks who were in band and in chorus and um, what was that even like? There was a magicals dinner, magicals. Oh, madrigal! Yeah, that was part of the the uh, music department, the choral department. Yeah, yes, yeah. it was so fun. Um, and then we even got a new principal while I was there, and um, I was asked while I was on the newspaper staff to go spend the day with the new principal, walking them around interviewing them and i remember i could go into the front office and just ask the principal different questions for the newspaper and Uh ask the dean questions and it it felt like you had a backstage pass to go ask anyone that's right anything and it still feels that way today because i can call up authors who are coming out with new books or um message different people on social and bring them on and it's just such a fascinating way to walk through life having questions really deeply thinking and then having people to bring on and and talk about it so it's such a gift that you gave all of us thank you so much Well, if you hadn't taken the initiative to sign up, that's the that's the first step. The individuals have to take the initiative and then hopefully they get into something that, you know, can possibly change their life. I mean, so many times both Don and I hear from students every once in a while. I mean, we hear from students all the time, but every once in a while it'll be. I had this thought today and it made me think of this back in the day. Um, And so that's a lot of fun for us. That's awesome. That's awesome. And keep going with it because I I don't know if I would even consider myself good today. I think what's good about what I do is just consistency. I just kept going at it and and creating more. Um, I remember you would hand back stuff to me and I like my writing, I would turn over to you as a copy editor, you'd read it, you'd look over it, you'd take out your red pen and mark up the paper and you'd give it back to me. And every single paper, you know, freshman through senior year came back with a ton of red on it, but it made it better, (laughs) right? Like I think some people could let that get them down or make them shy away and think, oh, well, I'm no good at this. No, everybody, even if you're working at the Chicago Tribune, they probably get their papers turned back with red all over it. They got to go make edits and and you just keep going, right? Right, right. And uh, it also helps to have a little conversation about it too. Not just, not just mark it up and hand it back, but talk about what, what those marks are and how things are going um, and how to make it better. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Keep going, kids. Um, (laughs) Keep at it. Thank you so much for being here, Miss T. Thank you for being you and just your work. It's so impacted my life in the best way. And I just can't thank you enough. Well, thank you, Julie. This is fun. Want more episodes? Check out our parent podcast, Angels and Awakening. Beautiful souls, if you're super excited to develop your own intuition, go to theangelmedium.com and become an angel member. Angel membership is for the whole family. Parents get access to hundreds of hours of course content, intuitive development circles, small groups, and more. Each week, members get fun, new family dinner conversation starters to boost family connection and help kids build confidence. 
And starting January 1st, 2023, kids get access to spiritual workshops, pre-recorded energy healings, and live events just for them. Start today with a five-day free trial at angelwellnesscenter.com backslash free trial. And if you're the family who's really excited, you're ready to go all in developing all of your unique spiritual gifts, kids age 14 and up can now enroll in my Angel Reiki school with a parent. That's for the healers among us who feel called to grow their intuition to the max and serve humanity with their gifts. You'll learn Reiki, mediumship, how to deliver angel messages, and how to start your own family business. That's the Angel Reiki School at theangelmedium.com. Details are in the show notes. Now, friends, do this meditation with me to connect with your angels. I want you to begin by imagining God is pouring unconditional love through the top the crown of your head. Feel it as this unconditional love fills your body with a yummy, delicious, tingly energy from head to toe. God's unconditional love fills you so much that it begins to radiate out from your heart like rays of energy radiating out from the sun. Imagine God's infinite, unconditional love flows from your heart to everyone you love. Imagine this love flowing to every person in your school. Imagine God's unconditional love going to every person in the entire world. And imagine the world sending love back to you. Your angels remind you, friends, that they're always looking out for you, guiding you, directing you, and protecting you. Friends, talk to God and your angels all day long, and then tune into your heart to hear the positive, loving messages they whisper back just for you. <laughs> 